Hello everybody and welcome to another light novel review. In this video I'm going to be talking about part 3 of Nishio Ishin's Owari Monogatari, the climax volume of the Monogatari series. Well, okay, of the first three seasons. There is an epilogue volume after this one uh, that we do have in English, which I'll review at a later date. And if you keep up what's happening in Japan, Nishio Ishin has gone on to write a number of Monogatari books beyond this one. However, when this was written, it was sort of the finale of the series. And it really does hold that position of tying together a lot of the events of the first three seasons and bringing it to a satisfying climax. If you want to pick up your own copy of this one, I'll have links in the description down below. And if you want to know more about the English publication of the Monogatari series, I'll have a link to EnglishLightNovels.com where you can check that out and uh, pick up some older volumes if you haven't been keeping up with the series to date. Part 3 of Owari Monogatari is split into three separate parts. Now, if you remember, and slight spoilers ahead, back in the end of Koyomi Monogatari, our main character, Araragi, found himself going to pieces. Like, literally, because he got cut up into pieces. Ah! Uh, <laughs> then we've had the past two volumes of Owari Monogatari, parts one and two, that were telling us past tales, filling us in on events that were hinted at within the series, but had never actually been detailed. Now with part three, we return to the present. It opens up in that moment of Araragi's death. The book itself is then split into basically three distinct sections. The first section detailing how Araragi comes back from the dead. <laughs> I mean, I, that, I guess that's kind of a spoiler, but like you basically know within the first few pages, that's what it's all about. So it's really not that big a spoiler. Uh, the second part is then Araragi going on a date for a day with Sanjo Gahara, which sounds very strange given the events that are happening in the first part. And even stranger when you figure it's sandwiched into the final part, which is the final showdown with Ogi Oshino, who we know has been pretty much the antagonist for quite some time. And we're finally going to find out exactly what her deal is, what her plans were, and why she has been so obsessed with Araragi for a good chunk of this final season and beyond. And hey, you know, if you like light novel reviews or you like other stuff I do on the channel, like unboxings, podcasts, and stuff like that, make sure you hit that like button. And if you're brand new here, make sure you hit that subscribe and the bell notification so you don't miss any of my future videos. Now, Owari Monogatari Part 3 has some pretty heavy lifting to do. If we go by the English release, this is the 18th volume of the Monogatari series, and it's got to kind of act as a way of reiterating, rehashing, summarizing, moving forward, and solving and answering a lot of unanswered questions. It's a lot to do in a single book, and when I've already told you that one part of it is just Araragi and Sanjo Gahara going out for a date, you're probably wondering just how well it manages. And the answer is, pretty well actually. There are a few things that I'm going to say about this book that I think it could have done a little bit better. Uh, really the main complaint that I have is the pacing. The pacing of this one is a little strange because it opens up in very typical Monogatari fashion where we have a lot of banter between Araragi and another character. Which seems very strange given the situation, but uh, it is what it is. However, this opening part really does kind of act as a Koyomi Araragi, this is your life kind of moment and kind of going over decisions that he's made and what the outcomes of those decisions were and what potentially may have happened if he had chosen something different. When we get to part two and we have Araragi going on this date with Senju Gohara, there are some events that happen while they're out that obviously still advance the overall plot, but I felt in a way that this was more of a give us a glimpse into the characters, give us more 
of a chance to sort of settle down with Senjo Gahara, who has been this figure that has been very important and central in Araragi's life, but she really hasn't played a lot of very active roles within the series. I mean, she honestly hasn't been featured in much, and it's only been for a couple handful of pages at a time. Given that she's Araragi's girlfriend and has all this sway and everything else, she's been paid a lot of lip service, but not really been present. And I think this sort of middle chapter was there to give a glimpse into potentially the future of Araragi once he kind of deals with this immediate threat, to, to give us an idea of just what his future could potentially be once he's free of aberrations basically hunting him. Uh, it is a good little character study of Araragi and Sendra Gahara, and it does kind of have those sort of, sort of uh, it gives you that pause before, of course, you dive into the much more climax heavy third part. But at the same time, it does kind of feel like you've hit the brakes, which is a little strange in a final big climactic volume. And then when you hit the third part and it's really like we've got to hit the ground running because we need to reveal everything. Again, the pacing here is a little strange because a lot of that reveal is literally done by a character telling you all the answers, uh, which I'm not a huge fan of that, like, info dumping aspect, but I guess I kind of see how it was necessary, especially when you come to realize that Ogi's backstory is very convoluted, is involving events far beyond what we probably initially thought, and that it is so intricately tied to this journey of Araragi over these, you know, 18 plus volumes. So it's kind of necessary, but again, it, it's putting the brakes on that pacing a bit. So this doesn't feel like a volume where you're hitting the ground running and that there's lots going on and that there's all sorts of action and threats and everything. It doesn't feel that way, which is very, I guess, kind of odd given the high stakes, but at the same time, I mean, it's Monogatari. I shouldn't be all that surprised. In fact, even when I started reading the beginning of it and it was very much the banterish part, I kind of thought, man, Nisho Ishin, it's just because you haven't written this character for a while and you are just so ready and thirsty to have the banter that Hararagi and this character typically had. I can feel it. I can feel that you brought this person back into this book at this moment just so you could have them go back and forth. So I shouldn't be surprised that, you know, there was certainly that aspect of the book. That said, as I mentioned, the reveal of Ogi, the, the overall structure of the book, the eventual conclusion of this book, is really satisfying if you've read all of the volumes to date because it ties so much of it together. There are so many events that, as a reader of the Monogatari series, that you are like, oh, and you know, you just, you have like those aha moments where you're like, oh, I see. And it was funny because as I was reading it, there was a number of times where I thought to myself, how far in advance did Nishio Ishin actually plan this? Like, it, is this really because he planned this 10 books ago or even longer? Or is this because he had some faint ideas about things and then came up with an idea to thread them all together? I would love to know that. And maybe Nishio Ishin has said so somewhere in an article I'm not familiar with. He certainly doesn't say anywhere in the afterwards of the books. If he's commented on that and you know where, please feel free to direct me to it in the comments down below. But as I said, it, it, it really ties so many different things together and you see the reason why Owari Monogatari parts one and two were so vital for this conclusion and for the conclusion to make sense. But at the same time, because they were so vital, you also sort of get an idea of why it was important to tell them close to the end as opposed to way back when they actually happened 
in timeline. That sounds very convoluted, but I'm hoping you kind of understand what I'm saying, that it was almost like Nishio Ishin needed those events to be much fresher in your mind because they were so important to how this all ends up tying together. Whereas if he had told them eight books ago when they actually happen in timeline of the series, you may not really have, it might not click as much with you and, and make you kind of go, oh yeah, this makes sense. That's my feeling on it. Uh, and as I said, the overall though, as a long time reader, really satisfying end. I did enjoy that there were a number of ways that Nishio Ishin was able to bring back certain characters in a way that didn't feel entirely forced, that using very sparing moments that he was able to give us a glimpse into the potential futures of some other characters and to give us an idea of what's happened to them in the time frame that we really haven't seen them because let's face it there's so many characters in these books and they appear and then disappear for volumes and volumes and so it was really i felt a good tie up a good way of just saying hey we did this thing and you've been wondering how that worked out this is what's happening you wondered how this character was doing after all this craziness from the last volume they were involved in here's how they're doing overall i felt this one was a really satisfying end to the Monogatari series. I'm very interested to see just exactly what is done in Zoku Owari Monogatari, the sort of epilogue volume, because honestly, this one kind of feels like it should just be the end and left alone. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to see what that epilogue volume adds to the penultimate end of the first three seasons of Monogatari. And as I said, when Nishio Ishin wrote it, the end of the series as far as he seemed concerned. For my next review, I'm going to continue on with uh, reading ongoing volumes. This one particularly because A, I've heard a ton of high praise for it, and B, it is June, it's Pride Month, and this seems to be one of the very, very, very few light novels that we have in English that seems to be a somewhat decent representation or at least has been embraced warmly by the lgbtq community and that's going to be volume number two of i'm in love with the villainous in the meantime if you want to help support the channel directly i've got a link you can click on that join button down beneath this video just like these fantastic individuals did that you see their names rolling here beside me these are my members there are some perks that are exclusive for members if you're able to, I really do appreciate it. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, bye bye for now.